Bangladesh, a rapidly developing nation in the South Asian subcontinent, has been an exemplar of major improvements in key global health indicators since its independence just over five decades ago. Breakthroughs in health technologies, advancements in vaccines, primary health care, and low-cost innovations to save lives such as oral rehydration solution stem from work done in Bangladesh. Over the last 20 years, the Bangladesh government, national NGOs, and the private sector have collaborated in pioneering new ways to leverage technologies to increase the timeliness, coverage, and quality of healthcare for as many of its nearly 165 million citizens. Across a number of sectors, education, agriculture, and financial transactions, digital technologies have now become the natural way of doing things, even in rural Bangladesh. Health is no exception. The National Health Information Solutions, deployed at scale by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, are covering services for around 120 million citizens. Also, some NGOs such as BRAC Health Program have become paperless and providing health services to almost 70 million citizens through digital systems. Let us explore for a moment the lives that are touched by these digital innovations from mothers of newborn infants in distant villages to frontline workers struggling to deliver care with limited resources to national level policymakers and local level administrators who are working to optimize the national health system. <laughs> ক্লিনিকেতে যাব যদি কাজকর্ম সারিয়ে মন না মনে থাকতে পারে আবার সকালবেলা মনে করি দেওয়ার জন্য আবার মেসেজ দেয় মোবাইলে তারপরে কাম গোছে পরে আবার চেকআপের জন্য চলে যায় রেজিস্টার খাতা আড়াই থেকে 3 কেজির মত ওজন হবে একটা রেজিস্টার আমরা 3 বছর ব্যবহার করি অনেক সময় অনেক পাতাই খুলে যায় 3 বছর পর আবার নতুন করে আমাদের সব খানায় আবার রেজিস্ট্রেশন করতে হয় এখানে একবার আমরা যদি খানা নিবন্ধন করি তাহলে আমার আর পরবর্তীতে করতে হচ্ছে না গর্ভবতী মা এর যে আমরা সেবা দেব তারপর ঝুঁকিপূর্ণ মা এখানে চিহ্নিতই হচ্ছে আমাদের আলাদা ভাবে ঝুঁকিপূর্ণ মা এর চিহ্নিত করা লাগতেছে না ফিল্ড ভিজিটে যখন আমি পরিকল্পনা করি তখন ঝুঁকিপূর্ণ মাদের আগে প্রাধান্য দেই ওদের আগে সেবা দেই আমার অফিসে একটা ড্যাশবোর্ড আছে এই ড্যাশবোর্ডের মাধ্যমে তারা প্রতিনিয়ত যে কাজগুলো করছে সেই কাজগুলো অটোমেটিক্যালি প্রতিদিন যে কাজ করে সেই রিপোর্টই আমি আমার ড্যাশবোর্ডে দেখতে পাই যে কারণে আমি সার্বক্ষণিক তারা আমার তারা যতক্ষণ পর্যন্ত ফিল্ডে আছে কাজ করছে তারা তাদের নিজস্ব কাজগুলো করছে সেই কাজগুলো আমার মনিটরিংয়ের মধ্যেই থাকে সার্বক্ষণিক মনিটরিংয়ের জন্য আমাকে আলাদা করে প্ল্যান না রাখলেও চলে আমি আমার অফিসে বসে গাড়িতে বসে কোনো মিটিংয়ে ইভেন কোনো মিটিংয়ে বসেও আমি যদি মনে করি যে আমার কোনো এফডাব্লিউকে আমি মনিটর করব এখন আর নির্দিষ্ট করে কোনো সময় আলাদা করে রাখার প্রয়োজন নেই আমরা এনি টাইম এনি ভয়ার আমরা দেখতে পারি তাদেরকে আজকে পর্যন্ত আমার যা রিপোর্ট এটা যদি আমি আজকে চাই আজকে আমি দেখতে পারব অফকোর্স মেনি অফ দ্য ইনিশিয়াল চ্যালেঞ্জেস দ্যাট অ্যাকোম্পানি দ্য ইন্ট্রোডাকশন অফ নিউ টেকনোলজিস হ্যাভ বিন ওয়ার্ক আউট ওভার দ্য লাস্ট টু ডেকেডস বাট নিউ প্রায়োরিটিজ নিড টু বি অ্যাড্রেসড such as ensuring that the base of the economic pyramid can afford and access technology. Technology literacy across all levels of health system needs to be strengthened. However, the government of Bangladesh has already taken initiatives to create a nationwide digital health ecosystem to establish longitudinal tracking and evidence generation by integrating existing systems among the government, NGOs, and the private sector through FHIR based standards with continued multi-sectoral collaboration information system integration and appropriate citizen centered innovation digital health in bangladesh will continue to thrive and break new grounds
Welcome to this session about uh, the digital transformation for health. Uh, I'm Tobias Silbertsan, I'm your chair and moderator for this session, lead the global health tech network community with uh, 1,600 health tech CEOs and I'm extremely happy to discuss this digital transformation of health topic today with a distinguished panel of leaders from both the public sector and the private sector where we want to discuss together how this important task can be driven forward. We want to talk about digital first health systems, right? And with that term, we mean a, an evolution of health systems that includes digital first components that um, help us create an accessible layer for citizens and, uh, and patients. And um, ideally this becomes both convenient for citizens and patients. Ideally it becomes equitable. Ideally we are using digital tools to support sustainable behavior change of citizens and patients for the better. And Ideally, we reduce the administrative burden for healthcare workers through this to give them more time to spend with patients, with citizens uh, for better health and well being. And ideally, if we do this over the coming years, this also creates a positive economic impact for countries across the world, both by reducing the burden of poor health and increasing the well-being of the population, increasing and improving workforce participation, etc. To create such a digital first health system, four different dimensions need to come together. First, there is the traditional and the established and the proven way of delivering healthcare and that includes medications, that includes medical products, hospitals, outpatient practices. Then secondly, there are 20, 30 new digital health categories from online appointment booking to teleconsultation to digital therapeutics, patient remote monitoring that can be integrated into a digital first health system. Thirdly, there is the piece around prevention, sleep, nutrition, fitness, stress management. And fourth, of course, there's also precision medicine and personalized medicine. Bringing those dimensions together to improve health and well being is a task that requires a lot of leadership over the coming years. And this is what we like to explore with our panelists here together with you today. We would like to do this discussion in, in four rounds. And we try to make it as, uh, as interesting and also as informal as possible. So I will not do lengthy introductions of the panelists. Uh, um, if you like, you can see them on the, uh, on the website. Um, in the first round of the discussion, we will talk about the vision and the aspiration for digital first health systems, right? What is sort of a target state that we can get excited about? Then in the second round, we want to deep dive a little bit more into the benefits of digital first health systems. Thirdly, we would like to explore watch outs and risks related to creating and implementing such digital first health systems. And finally, we want to discuss really what could be collaboration models, how public sector entities, private sector entities work together towards digital first health systems. So without further ado, let's jump right in into the, the part uh, where we want to envisage a little bit the future, look a little bit at the aspiration. Anna, first of all, congratulations to your, your new role. I wish you lots of joy and success. And um, you know, you've, you have this wealth of experience related to digital health and related to digital first health systems. Could you share a bit what is your vision, what is your aspiration, what kind of digital first health systems do you envisage? Thanks, Tobias. 
thanks to us and uh, welcome everyone. It's great to see such a such a great participation in this session. So we've heard multiple times over the last uh, day and a half that the mantra business as usual is not enough to accelerate progress to meet the health SDGs. If we continue doing things the way we've been doing them before the pandemic, during the pandemic, we're simply not going to reach the global goals that we've set for ourselves. And I think the pandemic has served as an inflection point for digital. It's changed the conversation that we're having today. During the pandemic, driven by necessity, we've seen nations step up with, with innovations and tools that were readily at their disposal. We've seen technologies such as mobile phones be used to uh, spread information to citizens who needed that, that knowledge at a time when information was dynamic and changing. We've been sending out guidance to health workers. We were um, providing remote patient consultations all around the globe. The, the Pandora's box of the potential for digital was really opened up. And I think uh, advanced analytics were even beginning to be used, AI machine learning to try and identify uh, what were the biggest risk factors for COVID-19 progression and which patients needed to be prioritized in this very, very chaotic time. But what we also saw was that in many cases, the enabling environment, so that is to say the public trust the foundational technological architecture that's needed for scale was not adequate to support the, the pandemic response. And so the digital health conversation as part of this, this lesson learned, as you've just said, uh, mm -hmm. Tobias, has, has really shifted with this realization that we were not ready to maximize the potential of digital first. And so WHO is ready to, to uh, partner in moving this ecosystem forward and to help uh, lead this shift. We have a strategy. All the member states have gotten together prior to the pandemic and ratified what is known as the Global Digital Health Strategy. And it, it articulates very simply, it's about leveraging technology to improve health for all, but in a way that is uh, appropriate, affordable, accessible, giving a strong emphasis mm. on equity so this digital transformation doesn't inadvertently leave anybody behind. And it also emphasizes the importance of not reinventing the wheel. There are so many great ideas that can be repurposed, reused, and lessons of success and lessons of failure that can inspire progress in neighboring countries across regions and around the globe. We're really faced, we have, we have to stop thinking about this as digital health, but as a digital transformation of global health. Mm. And, and I think to shepherd this and fast track UHC, we have to understand that we are building a complex architectural building, right? You cannot build a multi-story building without that clear blueprint without an architectural plan, without the necessary building codes and legal structures that ensure the building is safe and is capable of holding the weight that it's supposed to hold. So I think, you know, these foundational investments are now where we're seeing the conversation turn to so that we can foster an environment, an ecosystem, where, as you saw in this introductory movie, many members of the ecosystem, entrepreneurs, innovators, have some guidelines against which to build innovations so that we have an environment of interoperability, so that it's patient-centered and a patient does not have to contribute their information each time they go to a new provider, but that that information is shared across uh, the network. I think having clear costed national strategies is the first step of that process. And that's really the vision that we're, we're starting with, making sure that mm. countries have a plan and that countries are in the driver's seat. Last of all, I think uh, WHO's role is really to assist member states in the planning, 
in building that architecture, in training the workforce of the digital future. Ask yourselves, do we have staff who are trained and capable and ready to not just work within a digital architecture, but to maintain that digital infrastructure and to participate in hmm. the care that, uh, that, that, that data stream uh, provides us with. So I'm really excited. I'm really excited by the opportunity. I'm really excited by this inflection point that we're at and the partnerships and collaborations. We've met with many of you across this, uh, uh, this panel today. And, and I think there are new and exciting partnerships and collaborations that will make this vision uh, realistic. Thank you, Adam. Wonderful. I'm very happy that we, we have a leader from India joining us remotely for this uh, panel discussion today. Um, and I would love to invite uh, Lav Agarwal to join us and, uh, and share his perspective. Uh, Lav is from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare from the Government of India. Welcome, Lav. It's a, it's a pleasure having you today. And uh, would love it if you could share with the audience uh, what vision you are pursuing in India related to digital health and a digital first health system. What benefits or services do you have in mind that you would like to make available to citizens in India? Uh, thank you, Mr. Tobias. Uh, I mean, you know, the starting point is I'm able to attend the conference digitally. So I think that's where we realize how technology can be a game changer. And uh, talking about India's journey, I would like to highlight it was our national health policy of 2017, which mentioned that digital health should be mainstreamed into healthcare service delivery mechanism. And from there started our journey. And now we have launched for the last two years a national level national digital health blueprint which is again supported by ayushman bharat digital mission that is long live india digital mission an architectural approach on how to break silos within the digital health system it obvious i would like to highlight when we started our digital journey which was around 10 to 15 years earlier we had a lot of large scale digital health system but we realized that over a period of time that Something what has been pervading in physical space, that is lack of communication between two people, also for some reason got pervaded into the cyberspace. And we realized that softwares are not talking to each other. And this be the case, you do not actually get the best advantage of a digital health ecosystem which can be created. So we started with this vision of primarily removing the egos of the software to creating an ecosystem of softwares with an overall vision to create electronic health record for 1.35 billion people of this country. If I were to highlight not only services, actually what it offers to us is very critical. So digital health can actually offer primary advantage in terms of ensuring continuity of care across primary, secondary and tertiary healthcare services. It can lead to better quality. Clinical decision support system could be a simple tool, but it can ensure that whether it is the urban area, whether it is the remote and rural area, you can actually ensure right quality treatment being made available. Remote treatment through telemedicine could be one of those approaches. And similarly, customized treatment plan could be something which we can then envision if we have this electronic health record is in place. And most importantly, uh, I need to highlight that from a public health perspective, the policy planning also would be one of the area where we would be focusing on. As part of our Aishman digital mission, I am happy to highlight that we will be interviewing all the digital initiatives which have been happening across the country through creation of interoperable health record across the digital health spectrum, primarily focusing on ensuring that there are three registries, a registry of a patient, registry of a provider, as well as also registry of a facility, which will help me establish a unique health interaction. And then after that, a longitudinal display of it would actually ease our situation. In terms of specific inputs, if I were to highlight, be it maternal and child health, be it program service delivery, be it ensuring comprehensive primary health care like management of MCD, disease surveillance, insurance, health, telemedicine, teleradiology, tele ICU. I can actually also talk about tele-education, something which we had very vividly used during COVID-19 to ensure that 300,000 health facilities across the country have talked about COVID protocol. So there will be umpteen of these examples which will be put in place. But what is very critical from India's perspective is to break those silos 
and create an ecosystem of digital health intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Lav, and looking forward to exploring that in, in more detail as we, as we continue this discussion. Uh, Garth Graham, welcome to this panel discussion. You're a, you're a practicing cardiologist. Uh, you are the head of uh, healthcare and public health at uh, YouTube. I would love to explore a little bit with you, you know, as a tech company at YouTube, and you are working in the consumer health space, right? And, and Google and YouTube are in direct contact with citizens all the time. What are the citizens and, and patient needs that, uh, and desires that you pick up? And, uh, and, and what is your perspective for a future health system, therefore? Sure. Thank you all for having us. You know, I think it's important for us to remember that at the center of all of this are individuals. Uh, patients, uh, mothers, like we saw in the video earlier, um, grandparents, folks who are sitting around at dinner tables, um, who are a part of their community. And the real thought pattern is how do we utilize the tools, the technologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence, information uh, platforms like ours, um, the whole healthcare ecosystem exists for those individuals to become healthier. And it's important to have them at the center of all of our conversations, plannings, and strategy. For us, um, uh, what we realized is um, as a platform, uh, 2 billion, upwards of 2 billion people come to our platform seeking questions and answers. That's a third of the world's population. So we know that we're engaging people along their health journeys on a day-to-day, -day, minute by minute, hour by hour basis. And our role is really to empower those individuals, uh, both at the like, an individual level, a community level, and at scale to make healthier decisions. So the whole ecosystem, as I was articulating earlier, really exists for that purpose. How do we make individuals healthier? And so um, our overall vision is this concept of information being a specific determinant of health, meaning um, the information that people receive allows them to live healthier lives and allows them to engage in a healthcare system in a more patient empowered way. And that one component of the, of the ecosystem exists along with um, the way Siemens deploys, deploys technology at scale, the way um, individual country strategies are able to uh, put together the fabric again that uh, empowers the individual and that community. So for us, we see ourselves as an as a integral part of the patient journey. Um, I often give an example to people that, you know, quite frankly, um, going away are the days of flyers and billboards in terms of way people receive information. They receive it as um, um, either on their phone um, or other digital means as a part of their daily journey. And the question is, how do we all show up as part of that um, journey? And that's where um, we see our role um, from the uh, Google and the YouTube perspective to be a part of that patient journey and to be a real part of their lives. The last point I'll make um, um, is at the end of the day, um, when we think about what's happening across the world, um, if we aren't able to deliver for our communities the kind of resources, the kind of infrastructure, the kind of technology, um, the kind of vision that makes each individual empowered to live their best life, then we're missing the mark. And so overall, the goal has to be, again, having that um, individual experience, that individual person as a central part um, of this uh, patient-centered uh, ecosystem. Thank you, Garth. Let's explore now a little bit more the, the benefits of such a digital first health system that, um, that we, we envisage. Uh, Bernd, good morning and welcome. Um, as CEO of Siemens Health in Niers, you are, you're right in the middle of uh, healthcare digitization. Uh, can you share with us what are the benefits that you are most excited about in a digital first health system? Yeah, thank you for the question and thank you for having me. Um, I think it's super important to really almost uh, to start the discussion with, with the why. Yeah? Why do we do this? And uh, because digitalization is a means to an end. Um, and uh, but, but what I think is really exciting is that uh, when I think about the three biggest challenges in healthcare today, yeah? digitalization and a digital first system can play a major role in all three of them. Yeah? So the three are, number one, three billion people don't have access to care in the way we have the privilege to have it. Yeah? 
second is the workforce crisis yeah, and healthcare productivity, and third is the rising importance of the NCDs, of the non-communicable diseases. Yeah? In, in, in all three, digital health can make and will make a major difference. Yeah? When it comes to reaching patients where they are, in to the to get access for the three billion people I talked about, um, it is not a sustainable thought to believe that we will build up a system with all the specialists and so on as we know it, maybe here in the city of Berlin. This will take by far too much time. Yeah, but digital can transport the necessary knowledge and can bring healthcare to where it is needed. I think this is number one, and this is really mm. exciting. And I really like that you chose to call it digital first and not digitalization, yeah? because digital first means not using the paradigm of what has happened in the last 2000 years, um, but to really think from, from scratch. Yeah? Second, productivity or the workforce crisis, digitalization or digital first can massively help to take away routine task or the burden of not much value adding routine tasks from these super important and scarce healthcare professionals yeah so that they can focus on what they are really really good at and also on the em uh, to, on the empathy which is necessary yeah and then number 3 i talked about the non communicable diseases yeah and this is where digitalization is so important because we, why do we talk about personalized medicine or precision medicine? Because in, in the NCDs, every patient is different. And that means we need to, with digital tools, assess exactly what the patient condition is, derive the personalized therapy, and use digitalization and AI to build this bridge and to engage with the patient over time because it's typically a longer term and sometimes lifelong journey for a patient. Yeah, much different than in um, in the so to say simpler diseases which we are on a relatively good way to overcome. Thank you, Ben. Professor Kolsek, uh, you're the minister of state for the president in Senegal. Uh, welcome to this panel discussion. It's wonderful to, to have you and speak with you. You have led very interesting work in digital health in, in Senegal. And uh, therefore, I would, would like to ask you if you could share with us a bit about the work that you've done in Senegal around digital health and what are the benefits that uh, you have seen on the ground for citizens and patients? Thank you. I would like, first of all, to just put this very clear, is what we want. What we want is to improve access to care and prevention. What we want is quality of care. We would like also to increase knowledge. And we think that for that we need a digital transformation. It's not only to use digital, because I have experiments that we have a lot of experience on small things. It's really a, a transformation. And this need to be cross-cutting all the, in all the system. It's not something you will do just some, in some place and in another place. You, you need to look at it uh, as an holistic approach. I would like also to, to say that uh, mobile, for example, one of the things we are using is mobile phone. And uh, what we have seen, seen in Africa in general is a lot of increase of use of mobile phones. And in Senegal, we have a very uh, important penetration with uh, some, it depends on the figures, but sometimes it is like 100%. Everybody has a mobile phone. But it is not only to have the, the mobile phone, it's also to use it and to have access to internet. And this is maybe the more difficult thing we have. 
because we have mobile phone, but we don't have always, uh, I will put this, maybe if you have time to speak on the challenges, because this is what is very important for us. Mm. But also, uh, we have seen with COVID-19, uh, a lot of an increase, and I say a speed increase of uh, innovators, and particularly young, young uh, innovators. And this shows us that we need really to, to do something because we have the capacity. We can use it, but we need to do that in a proper way. The proper way is this strategy. We have also a strategy for uh, digital transformation, but now we need to act and to do that at large scale. I would like to give you maybe some examples, but I don't want to speak just Senegal. I would like to tell you that, for example, what existed in Rwanda for the drone when they started to, to send blood in the remote area, I was myself thinking, is it uh, uh, cost effective to use it only for blood? And I was so happy to see with the COVID-19 that they have used it also to send diagnostic tests, etc. So it is a technology which can be focused, but we can be also used. And this is for me a good example when we look at Rwanda. You have also in other countries uh, the possibility, for example, in West Africa, to use only the WhatsApp to be able to uh, disseminate uh, information on outbreak, Ebola, etc. In, Ag in Ghana, it was more counterfeit. You have Senegal also, Institut Pasteur, they, they, they had won a prize, the Gallian Africa Prize on uh, diagnostic, rapid diagnostic test. It was done not just from an entrepreneur, but uh, 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 an institution. So we have a lot of uh, examples. I can say also telemedicine. Uh, I can look at uh, uh, e-learning platform. And this, we did it with um, AMREF. And it was a very successful program to put uh, to, to try to catch up and put people in a l l more high grades just by having one, two years of learning, e-learning. And this has been very good also to stabilize uh, the, the, the trade union because it was one of their problems to, to ensure that they can uh, progress. And this has been done thanks to the e-learning. I, I, I think that we have a lot of, uh, uh, I, I can say, examples, and particularly platforms for uh, case management, uh, for early uh, warning. This was also important, particularly when you are looking at epidemic. So this is, uh, for me, a lot of possibility we have been using in Senegal. But I can tell you that one of my biggest deception is that we don't have it at scale. And this is uh, something we need to work on. And we have a lot of ideas also on that. And I think that uh, this will help us because if it is only projects and not a program at large scale, one small population can be happy with that but often also it stops. Mm. And it is why I would like to uh, promote really integration of digital health in the health system and not parallel programs. Thank you. Thank you, very important points. <clears throat> and thank you also for sharing the, you know, the benefits that you've seen with digital health related to COVID-19 pandemic, right? Uh, one of the the most exciting papers I've seen here in, in Europe was uh, using patient remote monitoring during COVID-19, right? Spotting complications early on day seven, eight, nine, ten, when they suddenly emerge by uh, and, and then being able to, to see when the oxygen saturation of the blood uh, drops down and university Clinic of Heidelberg has done 
uh, a great work there where they showed that in their cohort mortality was uh, three to four fold lower uh, compared with the mortality in the neighboring municipalities, right? Simply using a relatively simple from a technology perspective, a digital health tool um, in, in service of spotting complications early and then very quickly intervening um, and helping the patients. Um, Helga, wonderful to have you. Um, you're a medical doctor, you're a youth representative based in Tanzania, and you're, you're part of the global youth mobilization. And uh, what I find particularly interesting, you've been involved in the Lancet Financial Times Commission around the topic growing up in a digital world and in the My Health Futures campaign. Uh, can you share your perspective uh, on digital first health systems from a youth perspective, please? Yep, thank you. Um, I'd like to give a background and I'll read and then my friends will appear in the screen with the view. Um, so the Lancet and Financial Times Commission on Governing Health Futures 2030, growing up in a digital world, released a groundbreaking report at the World Health Summit last year in 2021. So the Commission's bold report um, focused on shifting the narrative from the digital health to digital transformation of health. Observing the health systems across the globe are becoming increasingly digital first. The commission calls for a radical rethink on harnessing the power of digital technologies and data for a health future. It sets out a new vision for governing digital transformations that promotes equitable, affordable, and universal improvements to health and well-being. With support from the Swiss development corporations, the Commission was able to establish a youth team that harnessed the voice of young people from around the world in throughout the work of the Commission. As key stakeholders of the Commission, the young people have continued to support advocacy and dissemination of the report findings, including the creation of the My Health Futures campaign. The campaign aims to first to create space for young people under the age of 35 to share their concerns, hopes and ideas for improving health futures. And the second point is to disseminate the key messages from the Commission's report. This includes the importance of strengthening youth leadership in the design, implementation and evaluation of the digital first health systems and the governance. So during the first phase of this campaign, young people were asked, how can digital first health system deliver better health futures for young people? So today I'm actually honored to introduce the video featuring nine young people who have voiced their views, concerns, and hope for the future of health. So without further ado, let's listen to them. Thank you. In order to achieve a better health future for young people, a digitally enabled healthcare system must be looking at and recognizing the inherent risks associated with health data. That means that as an end user, I must know who is using my data, who has access to it, and I must have also consented to its use in the first place. To deliver better digital health futures for young people, we should prioritize privacy, agency, bias mitigation, public education, and user-centered design. We can harness the power of data and digital tech to put climate change-induced health threats at the very center of protecting the health of not just today's youth, but all of future generations' health. To me, digital first health system is the concept of using technology as the first approach you know, to improve an individual's health and well-being. And it is important to note that digital first does not mean digital only healthcare system. You know, what it does mean is that the first encounter or ongoing treatment is through a hybrid model, you know, of mixing in-person and virtual care, which has the promise of becoming the new norm. For me, a digital first health system is one that is accessible and available for everyone, especially for young people, which should be reflected in its design. The question is, how can we deliver better health futures for young people? 
Well, as a young doctor at the start of my career, I think that the digital first health system should upkeep the digital health literacy as its principle and core value. For me, a digital first health system is one which makes appropriate use of data and digital technologies to meet the needs of patients and providers and is co-developed with all actors within the health ecosystem to ensure that it benefits all. Digital health systems are crucial to progress the implementation and fulfillment of the right to health for all, especially for young populations. Ensuring the availability and accessibility of services, as well as the responsiveness and sensitivity to age, to gender, and to the diverse needs of populations and young people. Digital first health systems delivery to young people needs to be invested in education on how safe to use the services of the digital platforms that are being provided to young people. Thank you for sharing, uh, Helga. I, you know, I think you made a, a a very important point uh, related to creating the interest and creating the interest in health and well-being education. But, uh, you know, le leading a health and well-being program on, on company level, right? What we also try to do is to make it fun for people to actually think about their health and well-being. Can you maybe say a little bit more about that, um, uh, how you've explored that topic to, you know, on the one hand, increase you know health literacy right on the other hand also making it um, not only accessible but also fun for people to engage is there something you can share in addition yes um from the big six youth organizations we are champions of the non-formal education so this is on how you get to transfer knowledge to another person in a very safe fun friendly way and this doesn't need any person to be an expert to transfer the knowledge um, of, of, of the education of something that you actually know about. And we want everyone to be a champion. We're speaking about digital um, transformation on health. I want a five-year-old, a 12-year-old who can actually speak with the mother or the father or the uncle on something that gets to change the community in, in health. So they're able to use YouTube platform, showcase the anchor that there is, um, you know, we're speaking about non-communicable diseases. What are the best way of eating well, exercising in this platform? But through the youth organizations, we have a curriculum that this person can actually get to learn what are the safe ways of exploring the digital platforms. We have the SAF Smart platforms as the girl guide, uh, through the girl guiding platform. This guides the person, you can explore any platform um, in a safe way, which is the key part, uh, key component for young people to use these platforms in the safe way, but also in the productive, positive way. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess having grown up in a, a country in Germany where everyone seems to know more how their car works than how their body and their health works, I think there is a, there is a lot of um, lot of truth in what you said, uh, getting children engaged early in, and in a positive way around health and well-being. Thank you. We've explored now the aspiration and uh, and the vision for digital health. We've we've dived deeper into benefits of a digital first health system. Now let's let's also talk about some of the watchouts and the risks. And in the the video that you've shared, Helga, some of them have already been uh, been mentioned. Um, in your your role at the WHO, you mentioned the digital health strategies, right? And um, and a good strategy, uh, of course, doesn't only say what you should do, but also the things that you should, what what one shouldn't do or what one should avoid. Uh, can you share a little bit your experience as we move towards digital first health systems? What are some of the watch outs or the traps that you would like us to avoid? Sure, thanks, uh, Tobias. And, and first of all, congratulations on putting together a panel of five youth voices. It's really nice to be surrounded by my, <laughs> my fellow young people. So um, this is what digital health does for you. You know, it keeps you young and on your toes because you're constantly exposed to new ideas and new things. But, you know, let me start by echoing something Helga said, and, and that's really equity. Meeting people where they are 
is, is really critical. And digital first doesn't necessarily mean digital only. There's a big digital divide and a chasm where we have, we have millions, if not a billion people who still don't have the level of access that's optimal to have an effective digital health transformation. So we wanna make sure that going digital doesn't mean leaving people behind. Now, having said that, you know, one of the ways to accomplish this, this equity is through intentionality, right? Meaning, as we're designing these systems, ensuring that stakeholders are involved from the very, very beginning of that process, making sure that we understand our end users, we're, we're designing the systems to be accessible by, by all of the beneficiaries we're trying to, uh, trying to reach. We also recognize that you cannot build a shelter in the middle of a storm. So we have to start investing and building now for the future threats that we are certainly going to be facing in uh, the coming years and, and decades. And so in order to do this, we have to, as my colleague here said earlier, uh, we have to learn from each other. It's not just about the innovations happening in Senegal, but what all of the neighboring countries are doing, avoiding these silos and, and reduplication and reinvention of the same uh, innovations is, is a recipe for, for failure and a, and a waste of resources. So WHO has mounted tools like the Global Digital Health Atlas, which allows member states to register all of the innovations in digital health that are happening within their borders, not so that they can control them, but so that they can share and learn from, uh, from each other's uh, innovations. It's also really critical to keep in mind that the, the project approach, right? Uh, Madam talked about the, the difference between a project and a programmatic approach. And the development of singular solutions with, with one specific uh, purpose that are hard-coded are not very responsive to the changing needs of a dynamic health system. So, so these monolithic responses to one solution solving all of the digital health problems is absolutely not a recipe for success. It's the ecosystem where we allow multiple innovators to flourish and work with each other that will optimally create that, that future environment. And lastly, I think trust. Trust is a word that we use very often when we talk about technology, but it's not trivial, right? We saw in many cases during the pandemic where the lack of trust, and, and there's architectural trust and there's, there's human trust that we have to understand. Human trust is created when, as Helga, many of your stakeholders pointed out, when there's belief that their data is secure when there's an understanding that there, there is, there's an assurance of privacy and protection, that the quality of the information, as Garth pointed out, is reliable and valid. That's how you build trust. And so that's where we have to start, building trust at the individual user level, and then escalate that trust all the way to the architectural level, where we have trust, trusted networks, we have the data that's trustworthy, where you can provide a digital vaccine certificate or a test result and have that test result be seen as an authentic, valid piece of information, not just within your country as you're moving around, but potentially across borders. So those are some of the pitfalls, mm -hmm. I think, that we have to avoid and some of the, the standards to which we have to aspire as we design these future health systems. And you're mentioning a very important point about the, the architecture in total, right? In, in general, we usually have then the electronic patient record and e-prescription architectures um, as a foundational layer, right? And then more than 10, 15 of the digital health solutions, be it remote monitoring, clinical decision support, et cetera, right? They then benefit if there is actually a solid foundation around e-prescription electronic patient records, and, uh, and only then they can actually um, yeah, yield the full benefit that uh, that it's possible. So um, uh, we'll we'll get back to the architecture point uh, uh, in a bit. Then, uh, you know, as I said, we with Siemens Health and News, you are at the forefront of the the digital transformation of 
of health. And, uh, and you mentioned um, several benefits already related to healthcare practitioners as well as to citizens and uh, patients. If we now switch a little bit to the watch outs and the risks, what are some of the risks or the learnings that you've encountered that you, you like us be mindful of? So maybe again, three topics <laughs> I want to share. I think there's, um, I'm, I'm, uh, there are certain temptations yeah, when building digital solutions and the word solution maybe is already one of the uh, temptations yeah, because there is sometimes, you know, the feeling let's build the monolithic thing which create which which solves everything and um it's always much much better to start with a super concrete problem yeah which you solve and which you then scale up yeah so i mean we had uh, yesterday a discussion about you know what what to some extent google but also siemens health and years went went through when it comes to um, looking at platforms and and uh, if i may say i mean you know on the google side um when there was an intent to build a digital platform for healthcare so it was difficult but Google was founded as a search machine, yeah, solving a super simple problem, but very it's not simple, but well defined problem, yeah. But then it's it that one thing turned it over time into also the biggest um, answering machine, so to say, when it comes to healthcare questions, yeah. But so so it means you need to learn to build things iteratively. Yeah, and also when we as Siemens Healthineers, as a stupid analogy, you know, when we built our first MRI systems, we had one pepper, yeah, uh, to to have the proof of feasibility, and didn't design a whole body or whatever system, yeah, and and wanted to just start somewhere. And I think this is super important. Yeah, platforms develop but they don't get designed in the beginning. Yeah? This is, I think, how, how Google became what it was. This is how Amazon became what it was, yeah, and, and not with a big vision um, in the beginning. I think this is really, really important, yeah. Second topic is, of course, trust, yeah. One drop can spoil it all, yeah. So no shortcuts when it comes to data privacy or cyber cybersecurity. But the third point, and I think this is, as important to say we are also responsible what we don't do yeah? there is a lot of opportunity in digitalization and ai and when we overthink it and when we look at all kind of risks which are already in there in the non-digital world in the non-digital world there is maybe a bias in the brain of a physician yeah in the non-digital world mistakes happen by a physician yeah so when we when we make the burden of proof for technology higher than anywhere than than for anything else in the non-digital world we will not get there yeah and we have to also take the opposite that we basically need to look at it n that not having these these topics available at some point in time needs to be like malpractice. Yeah, I mean it's today when you when you fly to Berlin, yeah, and if the pilot says, "Hey, guess what? Today I fly and have switched off all the machines," yeah, because yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you would say, whoa, 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 yeah, but there is technology out there which can help you and which is much better, yeah, and this is basically where we need to get to, yeah, and, and having always this opportunity mindset and not overthinking all potential risks which are already out here in the non-digital world is, I think, super, super important, also in the public debate, yeah. Thank you, Bernd, a very important point. Um, Professor Kolsek, you you talked about your wonderful work in in senegal and uh, you you mentioned the benefits uh, did you also observe any issues bottlenecks you you can share with us yes uh, of course i think that uh, we need always when we have a problem to try to see how to overcome it and we need to identify the challenges and uh, the objective is again to ensure that we can go to scale, but also to, 
to ensure that all this will uh, contribute to universal health coverage. We need to have this very clear in our mind. And one first point I think is a challenge is lack of coordination at country level. Mm. We have many actors, uh, everybody is doing something. At the end of the day, as I said before, it's a project uh, focus and not a program. And uh, this is very important. And if a country want really this digital transformation, uh, the authorities need to coordinate and everybody can come with his plan, his, uh, his, his uh, project if they want. But this can be used for everybody. But it is important that we listen and we, we open our doors to all the actors. And after we will see together what will be best for, for the country. This platform needs to exist. If not, we will be again in the same situation. Another point is the architecture. Maybe just an idea. It is uh, for me often a problem to see that we uh, don't have enough power we didn't have enough internet. And this is showing that it is a multi-sectorial approach. The Ministry of Health cannot alone uh, succeed if he is not working with the Minister of, in charge of energy, Minister of all these people need to be part of the system. But work also with the private sector, we can come with some ideas and with the NGO, the civil society. This is really important if we want also to increase this, uh, we can say, system itself. Um, another point is capacity building. Hmm. Uh, we cannot have a, a long-term and sustainable program if we don't have the people. And often some countries are have decided to do, for example, I give the example of telemedicine. If you don't have also the people, it will not be something you will have for a long term. You cannot continue without any human resources, but they need to be trained also in digital. We, we can see in the human resources at country level, two types. Maybe often it's the oldest and the young. And the young are very digital. The old, oldest who are taking often decisions are not very uh, happy with doing that. It's a change completely. It's a mindset uh, changing your mind and it is not easy. And this is also an obstacle. We need human resources very well trained. And uh, uh, we have more and more also people who have learned informatics, et cetera. They are not med medical people, but they, they are needed and they can be used. We, another uh, point for me is the financing. <laughs> if we want a program at country level, we need also to look at financing. If you don't do that, you will be again for a short time, a little bit, and another time you do that. You need to have a good, investment case, but completely also uh, finance. If not, this is also a, a, a bottleneck we will have always to, to try to overcome. Finally, I would like also to, to, to come to the trust, because if you ha don't have a system who guarantees that the data are secure, this is a challenge, a real challenge at country level. You cannot have a system where you are adolescent, you are going to family planning, and it is clear that the day after maybe somebody will see that and stick with your parent and they start to, etc. It is like this. You have another disease. You don't want people to know what you have. And it is important also to ensure that it, can, it is not used for other things. You know, the, 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 we are a global village, and sometimes people can just give some data for to do something, but people would like to be secure. And this is for me an issue of trust, and several people have already said that. These are maybe some ideas and some uh, uh, challenges I have seen, 
But when we look at the system and we look at country level, sometimes you have a lot of others, but these are for, for me and for the people I have been working with uh, the main issues. Thank you. Thank you. And you, you mentioned a very important point, and, and thank you for raising the, the term investment case. But when we look at the data and when we look at the data on a country level, right, health and well-being can be a positive investment case for a country, right? Um, and it can have not only a beyond the health and well-being impact that we get, it can have positive GDP impact uh, through better workforce participation and uh, and the other benefits. And it can be up to 0 0.5 um, percentage points of GDP in one country. And the other part that uh, that I think is often not seen enough is the piece that you know investing strategically as a country in health and well-being usually also has a positive return on investment be it uh, two dollars for every one dollar invested up to six dollars for every dollar invested in in some countries right so in that sense i think there is also a piece around here as we develop digital first health systems right to see health a bit more as a strategic investment case for a country and less as a as a healthcare budget uh, that uh, that needs to be managed um, switching gears and, and taking another look at um, at India, if Love is still with us, uh, would would love to understand a little bit what are the what are the uh, I see that uh, the the line has been cut. So then let's switch to the the third uh, the the fourth part of the discussion, where we explore together how we can work together to build these digital first health systems right how public sector agencies how private sector companies can work together to uh, to achieve this together and uh, garth if we if we maybe start uh, uh, with you right in a sense you know youtube and google right we can almost say that you build a digital first consumer system right um, and um, and if we think about digital first health systems as you know interoperable systems and um, how do you as a as a leader in a tech company think that tech companies can contribute towards creating digital first health systems yeah um, so the first part is to realize i think as was said very well before we are an integral part of many patient journeys um, across the world people come to us with questions um, and look for answers um, that's personal to them uh, and that they're going to use to make very important health decisions. And so understanding that aspect and how we're already a part of that um, engagement model is um, integral for how we play a role in the overall ecosystem. So I, I often say to people, um, uh, and that's been so uh, obvious during COVID, information is a determinant of health. Um, there are many kinds of things that drive health outcomes. A lot of those things occur outside of the doctor's office. They're outside of traditional healthcare system. People are making decisions day to day, hour by hour, minute by minute, as I said earlier, in their daily lives. And I think um, 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 we are already a part of that patient journey. So our role really is to empower individuals to be able to make those decisions um, that allow them to live quality, healthier lives. Now, you mentioned there's one thing that we were talking about earlier, it's important to understand. Um, we have challenges with um, communities where their infrastructure is not in place to allow them to take um, advantage of um, healthcare technology um, in their very best way. We also have, um, and you see this in COVID, um, ways in which information gets um, a spread. People are asking questions, looking for answers um, a lot faster than the traditional healthcare system is producing them. And so are we engaging um, across industries, across um, uh, t uh, platforms uh, across um, different aspects of the ecosystem to really be present in people's lives. And that's really the key component is this concept of engagement, presence, and how we understand where people are along their healthcare journey and the infrastructure that's there. And so I think, um, uh, as, as you were saying earlier, I think um, from the Google perspective, we already know that, you know, we're where the world um, a big part of the world comes to for information. Um, certainly for YouTube, um, um, when we think about video, we're the number one place for video. 
And video is, an, is a very powerful tool to really take complicated medical topics and make it digestible, make it engaging, make it um, the kinds of things where from a visual aspect, people can understand um, where we may lose them with uh, complicated clinical words and technologies. Um, we're, you know, this idea of taking uh, healthcare out of journals, out of textbooks, um, out of uh, publications that matter a lot in academics, but sometimes don't matter a lot in people's daily lives. And how do you take that information and again, bring it into um, living rooms, um, um, into community settings, um, into dinner tables, um, into the kinds of places where people are having their conversations and making decisions. So I think um, we see our role very much in terms of um, answering questions um, and giving people information in a way that allows them to make healthier decisions. Thank you, Garth. Uh, Bernd, uh, if you could design a collaboration model between private sector and public sector towards digital first health systems, uh, what, what might that look like? Yeah, maybe I give it a little bit of a different, small different twist. Yeah, when you um, and we are talking a lot about digital health, yeah. Um, but then you could also wonder why do we talk so much about it, and where is the global big company? which is a digital health giant. Yeah, why is the topic so important, but we don't really see a big company, global, yeah? I mean, what you do, Google, YouTube, is also targeted to health. I mean, we could also say we are a digital company, we have 5,000 software engineers and Siemens health engineers and so on and so on. But I, you, you know what, what I, where I want to get to, yeah? And why is it so hard to develop a, a digital business in healthcare? Yeah? It's normally in a B2C world, yeah? you, you start to you develop a product yeah? and, and basically the major, I simplify, the major hurdle you need to overcome is, is it feasible and do, does my customer like it? Is it a benefit? Yeah? In healthcare, for very, very good reasons, yeah? you have to prove much more. Yeah, you have to first of all prove feasibility. It does its job. Yeah. Then there's a regulatory environment. Yeah. How is the product approved and 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 so on and so on for very good reasons. Yeah. Um, then comes the question: Who pays for the product? Yeah. The reimbursement question and so on. And then you need to change the habits of professionals, of patients, and in a system which typically is fragmented, yeah, the payer, the, the provider, the patient, and so on and so on, yeah. So there is a, there is a valley of all kind of topics you need to go through. And as I said, for good reasons, yeah, but I think what we, what one really, really needs to have in mind is, when designing a public-private partnership, it, the most important topic is how do you, how do we make the valley less deep? Yeah, by making sure this is the rule, this is the basic requirement, this is how the financial model is ensured, yeah, and this is the help you get in terms of adoption. If you need to do all this alone as a company, country by country, hmm. it's, it doesn't work. And that's why it's not there. Yeah. So I'm not asking for miracle uh, financial topics or so, but it's really about defining the basic rules and giving some more planning certainty because otherwise, um, many, many of the possibilities get stuck in that super deep valley. Yeah? Thank you, Ben. Um, Helga, I would be curious um, if we look at digital health roadmaps of, uh, of countries, right, we, we often have relatively little involvement um, of the, the young generation. And um, how would you 
change the way we implement digital first health systems? Um, I think you also need to appreciate that it's really, really literal. It's very literal and we are still using the terms youth representative. We have to make it normal, have, you know, we are six or maybe five are young people and one old person. So if we create that culture that <laughs> young person doesn't need to be a representative, you don't need one voice to speak for hundreds mm. of people, then that gets to be an improvement. And from my last conversation, when I was requesting for a meaningful engagement for a young person, we had a side event discussing on how to have meaningful engagement for young people. So that shows it's a problem. So what we need is that if you engage a young person, you know, the strategy, um, you have a strategy. Don't, we should not take it as one person, as a young person has spoken for other people. We would want um, young people to be taken as experts we have young doctors, young politicians, young engineers, even the students associations that we have, they are doing amazing things at that same, at that age that they are. We need to appreciate that and take them or be taken as experts rather than just a demography of a young person to check a box in that strategy and that development that we have. If we change that concept, I think, um, it's going to be a great thing. Um, I'm from Tanzania. I've founded an organization that is working with the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of uh, President's Office, Regional Dismission, Local Governments. They embrace me as the young person, but also they embrace me as an expert. And we are working together to improve the healthcare system in Tanzania. But how many other young people have been embraced? What if I would have met another person who is not you know, embracing the young person. That means that would have been the end of me doing what I really believe that would have improved the, the system of, of health in, in, in my home. So we, we, we need the culture of embracing young people as experts. We had a conversation yesterday with a friend and she was like, don't call me a young person because the other people who have taken a young term as a negative part, it's a young person she'll just speak or just speak and i'll just move on let's embrace the young person and let the young people be proud of being young but also being experts of what they know best they have studied about it they have worked on it but they have also experienced that thank you and <laughs> When you and the colleagues from the Lancet Financial Times uh, Commission shared also in the video, that most of them talked about digital health in a relatively cross disease, cross kind of setting. Could you share maybe with, with us in the audience a bit, uh, what were some of the focus areas, the one where among the the commission, the, the, the highest excitement was, right? Was it more around well-being topics related to sleep, nutrition, fitness, stress, right? Was it more on the staying healthy side or, um, or where some of the diseases in focus, uh, where, where sort of the, where was the excitement level of the campaign the strongest? So digital health is broad and I wish, and please we have representatives here from the Global Health Futures, they'll be available to provide further information. Digital health is broad, and we wouldn't want to pinpoint a specific area of health or digital platform because we're engaged everywhere. What we really want is, if it's about digital health for transformation, um, digital transformation for health, it gets to be in every single area and we are in every place that it is. Be health, be mental health. I mean, yeah, be mental health, be nutrition, be non-communicable diseases, neglected tropical diseases. But also we have experts in that specific space of mm. digitization itself. And that's why the young people engaged have different backgrounds. We are speaking about, uh, you know, One Health. Um, it's, it's Climate change is part of the health. Um, digitization has been about comes to health. Everything comes to one point. So 
we have we are everywhere as young people so engage us everywhere you think of specific area in health will be available and we're happy to be part of the movement thank you mm, thank you i'm um, ala how do you see the roadmap towards digital first health systems um right and and how do you see the collaboration across countries but then also the collaboration across public sector entities and private companies I think this is an important question first. Of the five young people and one old person, <laughs> we're going to have to have a chat about who that was. <laughs> I, I think it's it's a really important question, uh, Tobias. Uh, but if I if I might just uh, in try to channel some of uh, what Lord Love might have contributed to to the discussion, and and uh, Professor, your 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 comments about government being in the driver's seat and creating a, an environment. India has has a nice model that I think is is being replicated in other places as well, where they realized they had to create the rules of engagement, mm. and through the national um, digital health blueprint, which set out the rules of the sandbox through the national digital health mission uh, a government entity responsible to to curate and bring people together around a shared digital health vision but then also creating a technical architecture which allowed the private sector to engage according to the rules of of set by government interoperability standards uh, data standards in terms of how information had to be registered and made available to other systems. And so I think that there are models where government can be in the driver's seat and set the rules for a vast array of stakeholders to participate in this digital transformation. And that's really where you get the best ideas coming to the forefront, not when government tries to create apps and a digital system by itself, not where a monolithic system comes in and tries to solve all of the problems in one fell swoop, but where you create the, the conditions hmm. for digital transformation. And that means tapping into the, the untapped potential that exists at the local and national levels in, in countries. So I think, you know, as I've been listening to Bent and others, uh, you know, the, the important question about who pays and what's the value proposition, I've come up with three R's, right? It's rules, risk, and reward. If we can define the rules of engagement, and that's when I say we, I mean government and maybe uh, multilateral uh, convening authorities like, like WHO, come up with some of the rules in partnership with private sector. What 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 are the parameters we want to see in this ecosystem? Identify the risk. What are the reputational risks? What are the potential conflict of interest risks that the public might perceive if they see private sector engaged in this, this health, this delivery of healthcare and mitigate those risks? And then finally, what's, what's the reward? How do we pay for this digital transformation? Because there's no magical unicorn that's going to pay for the hours of coder time, the server space, the cloud computing, all these things have real costs. And I think we would, we would deceive ourselves to think that there is a magical solution where cost isn't real and that we haven't addressed the, the sustainable solution to the, the financial part of this puzzle. So, so I think, you know, it's, we, we at WHO are enthusiastic about this multi-stakeholder, multi-partner ecosystem, but we need to address those three R's to, to move forward. Thank you, Allah. And you mentioned the word um, local, but so far we've sort of discussed this topic mostly at a, at a national level or at an implied national level. But um, being a person who grew up in a tiny village in the middle of nowhere, right, and, and now sort of sees also some cities being very active around health and well-being, right, and other cities being less active about health and well-being, can you maybe say more about uh, how you see digital first health systems also happening or being created at a local level? So I'll give you a good example. There was a, an NGO in... in uh that was using what for agriculture for mobile mm. agriculture to see how we could optimize farming practices mm. right 
And so one of the things they did was identify farmers and agriculturists who were in the community doing positive practices that they wanted to highlight. And this national NGO working with the Ministry of Agriculture and Health came up with an architecture which allowed them to create content based, driven by the local star who was, who was modeling these positive practices. And so it was a, a national system, but highlighting the, the accomplishments and modeled by the, the local entrepreneur mm -hmm. Who had, who had been placed in, in, in the spotlight as a change agent, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I think there are ways of, of building, and, and YouTube I think is a, is a great example because it, it's, it's flush with, with hyper-local content that, that people can find the resonant voice within that, that massive platform that speaks to their experience, that speaks to you know, their socio-cultural background delivering the content in a way that that is at the stage that that they are in their health journeys so i think i think it's it's creating these systems but also allowing the voice the local voices to flourish that we have to be cognizant of final question to you alan uh, and don't put the microphone away <laughs> um i guess to 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 uh, to wrap up this discussion uh, What would be your ask um, in your new role as at uh, WHO, right? How would you like uh, private companies and governments uh, show up in in this building of digital first health systems over, let's say, the next decade? So, so a decade ago, nine principles were proposed and and widely adopted for digital development, and these included principles around openness, um, user-centeredness, person-centeredness, uh, dedication to open standards. And I, I just checked while, while we were on this panel to see how many groups, private sector, public sector, innovation teams had signed in to, onto this charter. And right now there's 304 members mm. of the ecosystem, of the digital health ecosystem that have signed on to these nine principles. And I think it's, it's that kind of a genuine uh, embracing of, of values that is the first step of, of joining together on this path towards digital transformation. We have to understand that we, are, we have a shared value uh, ecosystem, and then we can move forward to, to really working together. Well, and with, with digital tools, you know, having shown that they are able to change human behavior quite uh, profoundly right um, i think we are we are all excited here about using digital tools right to change health and well-being for the better right help citizens help patients help health workers to change their behavior for the better and um and i think then there is the big promise the big benefits that that you mentioned right um keeping citizens happy and healthy and making it fun, then finally helping patients manage their chronic diseases better and, um, and ultimately also then for countries and geographies to actually gaining economic benefit also through better health and well-being. With that, I thank you all. It's been a wonderful discussion. Thanks for being with us. Thank you to the audience and uh, I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day.